and I want to introduce our wonderful panel today full of magical, amazing women who are both event producers, filmmakers, and uh, just creative collaborators. It's very hard to introduce these women because they all do a lot. Um, so first up, we have Unique Yazi. She's an artist and designer, event producer, and co-founder of Cahokia, where we're at right now. Um, yeah, what, thank you, Cahokia, for hosting us today. Um, she also has Unique Designs, LLC, um, and in DigiDesign Collab, and a bunch of other stuff that, again, I would be here 10 minutes for. <laughs> um, next up, we have Lotus Lee Vasquez. Uh, she is a writer, producer, and director, um, and she also uh, was the director of the um, Immigration Paradox. That is a phenomenal documentary, if, if you have not seen it yet. Um, last but not least, we have Nita Bloom, who is an ASU filmmaker, uh, professor, musician, and a myriad of other things. Um, uh, and today we are going to be talking about how to make the magic work, um, funding your creative projects. And we have a lot to talk about. So <laughs> where to start? How to dive in? Um, uh, we are going to make this more conversational today um, because uh, true to collaboration, a lot of the work that we all do independently and together has to do with teams, has to do with building relationships, building conversations, building foundations. Um, and so uh, we do not believe in working in silos. Um, so. That being said, um, Nita, I'm actually going to start with you. <laughs> so um, we've chatted a little bit about some of your filmmaking and creative process. Um, I've also seen you in your magic doing your work, um, producing some music and producing some of your film, uh, your music um, uh, films for your music to produce and to promote. Uh, but with some of the projects that you've done specifically in LA, how were you able to bring them to life? Um, you know, you were are very ingrained in the industry, I would say maybe more so than the rest of us. So what was that process like for you from an independent filmmaker into kind of connecting with industry folks? Well, that's a great question. Um, I will say that I started uh, a long time ago in the film business after film school and uh, I was lucky enough to work at some really big companies like the History Channel, Sundance, National Geographic, and I saw a lot of films get pushed through to, from development stage all the way up to uh, production and then obviously post. Uh, you know, I had a hand in a lot of them, uh, and it was fun just to watch the process. I mean, the main thing I will say that all the filmmakers had in, in common was to have a very clear business plan and to start there and then really know what they're selling because a film is a product. Uh, as much as we want to believe that it's our art form, and we can, you know, believe that, we also have to be entrepreneurial in spirit. And so, that is the foremost to uh, the whole Hollywood uh, paradigm is making money while creating art that you love. So I tell a lot of my students now at the Sydney Portier New American Film School that I'm a teacher at, uh, just to create what you know, be very clear on how much uh, capital you're gonna have really mm -hmm. upfront. So having a really good uh, idea about budget and then also just engaging with what you know and why is it why is it this story you need to tell at this time? Uh, if it's something that you authentically feel is your story to tell, and it's something that can be produced within the scope of a, a certain budget that you can raise, so don't try to tell a sci-fi film that uh, was set uh, in the future. Uh, don't be the next Stanley Kubrick, if you can, uh, for your first film. Start off with character-driven chamber pieces uh, that are simply produced and uh, with maybe one or two actors, uh, one or two locations. Start off simple. I mean, some of the best films started off that way. If you look at Wes Anderson, he started with Bottle Rocket at University of um, uh, uh, Texas, UT, Austin, and he was a, a student filmmaker. He raised 10 grand. He shot it on 16 millimeter black and white film. Uh, he ran out of money, but he was able to get it completed to a point where he could make a short concept film. Uh, and it was 
inducted into Sundance, which was where you think, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to get into Sundance. It was a little easier back then to get into festivals and go that route of raising capital that way. But he uh, was seen that way and he was given $5 million to create what we now see as the original, you know, the feature length bottle rocket and that catapulted his career. So creating these proof of concept films are really valuable and getting them into the festival uh, space, like indie film festivals, right? Uh, that's going to get you some notoriety. That's going to probably get you some, uh, if it's done right and well, it's going to get you uh, investors to help you maybe create a feature length film in the future. Mm -hmm. um, Damien Chazelle also did that with Whiplash. Uh, he, when I was at Sundance, he, I got the chance to kind of like see his process and he started with a 10 minute film as well. Proof of concept, one room. If you've seen it, you can watch it on Vimeo. It's mm -hmm. Whiplash mm -hmm. short film uh, and it's 10 minutes and it's in one location uh, with, you know, a few actors. He had some extras, some musicians in it. Uh, but it's just very simply done. It won uh, the jury selection prize at Sundance, and then that was able to get him catapulted into uh, getting capital, and he was financed like $3 million for that film, uh, and he was able to then create a feature-length film. So it's I, I recommend, especially with my students, when they're raising five ten thousand $10,000 for their final capstone film we do at the program, it's a 10-minute film, I recommend that they start with what they know when they write something it's about their lives and it's something simple you know it's very simply produced but it's done right with good, good acting good set design good production value um, all of that and then crowdfunding like finding good crowdfunding um, through your friends and family through the the local community seed and spark has a lot of uh, connections where it'll tell you uh, if you go on seed and spark right now you can kind of see who in the area is making films that need help and you can actually support your local filmmaker that way and so they put their crowdfunding campaigns up there and you begin to create um, a little community of fundraising that way uh, and then you go from there then you put it into festivals and hopefully you can be seen because your work is uh, well done on a small scale and you can create a longer picture after that hopefully that's the goal I love that. I love that the, the idea of the structure that you don't have to go big in order to produce something that's sustainable, that's truly representative of your work and what you're able to do, and then be able to attract more funding, more individuals that want to be part of your project, you know, within the industry and beyond, and go from there and kind of scale at, at that point, a sustainable scale. And I want to pivot really quick because you said something really key about community, um, which is definitely something that when I think of the word community, I think of Unique Yazi. <laughs> she is the epitome of community when it comes to uh, just the powerful ways that you connect people together um, uh, and the ways that you kind of uh, shape shift. We've talked about that, your cyclone energy of how you create projects and bring them not just to life, but like almost this explosion of energy and um, creativity. So um, I will speak a little bit to uh, community as it pertains to producing events um, because you've done a lot of work on your own just as an individual artist and designer and then also had, you know, and have your uh, design firm, but then folding that into this place like Cahokia, which has been here for a little over a year, how important is that to create that community base to produce your work? Well, I love that she had mentioned proof of concept, right? And so um, I come from the Navajo Nation, I'm Diné, um, and moved here in the year 2000 and was really drawn to the downtown area because I love um, the energy that crosses over and converges and where you get to learn a lot about people um, very closely. Um, and I think it all happens in downtown Phoenix. Um, we trade stories, we go to you know, different mixers, and we really try and be active in our community. And so one of the things that I realized was that um, there was a lack of Native representation in a lot of these spaces. And so for me, creating community was all about, you know, carving out a place where I could be myself. Um, and it was out of that inspiration of um, just finding people that, you know, I can talk creative ideas with or begin to explain like a project that I was thinking about and 
um, a lot of this a lot of this momentum ends up being that uh, Native communities we love to gather. Um, there's there's this thing that I always tell people about uh, when I start talking about where I, ideas come from. Um, Western society kind of teaches things in linear fashion um, and timelines and you know how things are rolled out but natives we see things in a more circular fashion and in design I also do that and it's done through concepting it's done through um, ex uh, like practicing and then experimenting and then playing with ideas and it all folds back in but each and every time you make a fold right your failures teach you something new and you pivot and you have to learn from that and you keep going and, but you're still wanting to go to that solution that's right in the middle and you're still honing in. And so that's what I call that cyclone. <laughs> well, so we have, we have a, not, I, I wasn't prepared with a story about this, but we've experienced this together where, you know, I'm, collaborative but i think in a linear fashion because i like timelines i like structure there's some people in the audience that i've collaborated with in that way and beautiful unique she's like just let it flow let it happen it's 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 the energy is coming you just got to trust i'm like i don't know what you mean and then experiencing it first time like the native way of collaborating and designing is incredibly powerful so thank you for bringing that to this space and to phoenix but also enlightening us that it's already existed yeah, it's already existed in a lot of um, Native peoples. It's just how we operate. And so really, I just wanted to carve out a place um, that allowed people to come in and experiment and play with ideas. And that's what Cahokia is. But um, as far as like projects in the past, um, all of it was basically born from the need to create space, right? And the need to keep our place in that space. Um, and because we have historic significance to the history of Phoenix, to the history of America, to the history of these lands, I'm always like, okay, how can we get somebody in there to talk about that history from their own learned experience? And that's when I brought, you know, was able to connect with so many um, amplifiers. Um, I call them amplifiers. They're like people who do work, but they um, encourage and inspire other people and, and uplift them and like basically create that platform for other people's work. And so um, this space kind of offers that ability to do that. And Melody Lewis, who is also a part of our, collab or our connection here, um, she runs the Indigenous Community Collaborative. We have Candace in the back and she's our PR representative. And so really it's just building like a strong team and recognizing and valuing each other's passions and drive and just working together for that common thing that's right in that middle right of the cyclone mm -hmm. so that's the co community works because it already exists you just got to pull people in and create that impact create that social fabric love it and and she lives and breathes this you know every day you know i'm sure right after this there's some kind of collaborative project that you're like diving yeah, into we're all going to the award ceremony yes <laughs> <laughs> what up to indie film fest yeah. and shout out to maddie you know just the collaborative work that you do as well you you should be on this panel but um he's <laughs> like wants to be behind the scenes um but uh, you know speaking I, I really uh resonated when you talked about creating space and how important it is to have space to have representation to have a place to be able to create um, without those kinds of creative spaces it's really difficult to um, showcase your work or to have um, especially like a, a foundation for the industry to grow um, and so uh, Lotus you've talked a lot about um, kind of the way that you've created your work and we were just kind of getting to know each other in terms of the specific anchor project that you created. Um, how important was space for you, but also um, being able to sustain your project over such a long period of time in order to, you know, finally have a product that you can present, that you can screen, you know, because like screening is obviously so crucial to be able to showcase your work. Otherwise, you have this product with no opportunity to for people to see it so can you speak a little bit to that process about space and sustainability within long form talking films? about sustainability um, I don't know if you all know the background but it took me seven years to make my first documentary so it was a long time in the making however um, I think as a filmmaker and as a creative and I think what you uh, talked about as far as you know the native mind of 
not being completely linear and being more circular, you know, um, I think that's part of the reason that I just didn't want to, I wanted to get to the root cause of issues. And I decided to go into documentaries to talk more about social issues. And my approach was more as an activist. Um, after I graduated from film school, I decided to become an activist and came back to my hometown in Arizona to help in the desert, dropping off water and helping out with immigrant rights. Um, and for me, that was crucial in order to understand the, 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 I guess, plight a little bit more and what our people and, and everyone's, you know, perspective was happening at the time. So for me, it was really important to listen to everyone's voices. You know, obviously we're all biased, we're human beings and we're gonna be biased one way or another, but I was trying to be as objective as possible, and perhaps that's the reason why, one, that it took so long, but two, <laughs> funding, you know, um, we're independent filmmakers and it always takes, you know, um, the money to, to be able to sustain it. And not only that, this was back in, uh, when the recession happened here, so um, there was hardly any funds that were coming in and um, it was really hard, but, we knew that we needed to make this project. Everyone was fully invested. We got the whole community behind us because it was more of a community-based effort, grassroots effort completely. Uh, we had uh, started, this is before like the whole crowdfunding started um, online. We started doing videos and asking people, hey, can you donate to help this project happen? And we had a lot of community coming in, helping out. But not only that was it, you know, that people were donating, but um, it's a way to market your your mm -hmm. film, you know? That way when you're gonna expose it and you're gonna exhibit, you know, in the space that you want to, you already have an audience for it as well. Um, so luckily, you know, after the seven years in the making mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, asking for donations and being sustainable in that sort of way, um, as far as every single penny that we made, my husband and I, you know, um, he helped out a lot too and, and uh, I had started already with this documentary as an activist and then later on I met him and he helped out quite a bit and every single penny that we would make you know it would all go back into the documentary um, so we were pretty poor I sold my car <laughs> in order to make this happen you know as an artist and, and when you have like something that is so precious to you, which is community, right? And that you want a social issue to be well known, especially since I saw my community so divided between this issue, you know, no, regardless of, you know, age or race or class status, it was just crazy what was happening here, you know? And so I just wanted to create more of a dialogue when it came to that. So everyone was ready for that as well. So I think overall, just showing your passion for it was really helpful and having people jump on board for that. But also then we had angel investors that eventually were like, oh my gosh, I love your passion. I love what you're doing. We wanna also create unity in our community. So we had angel investors that came. They said like, hey, whatever you wanna do, we believe in your project, just go ahead and get it made. We got grants also, um, local grants here that also gave us some money. Um, as a result, I, uh, I had to become, learn how to be an editor. <laughs> I didn't know how to edit that well. So, and I was like, oh, I hate technology and this and that, you know? I'm like, what cable is this? <laughs> it's like HDMI, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big box of all these cables having to go through it. But man, I had to learn how to edit because editors are expensive too, you know? And uh, my hands off to all of them, you know? Like it, it does take a lot of work, but, um, I don't know how many of you would go into documentaries, but the story is not made until you go into the editing room. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, um, you know, learn how to edit, got that thing done. Uh, we did a lot of presentations. Um, one little thing that I don't think I had mentioned to Nicole before is I also went into leadership, um, um, political leadership uh, programs that they teach you how to fundraise for politics, but this is something that you can also use for your own projects, whether it be a film, whatever other thing, you know, mm -hmm. any way of raising funds is, is the same, whether it's for a politician, whether it's for a film, whether it's for your uh, clothing line, whether it's for your studio space, you know, it, it kind of follows the same kind of structure. 
So, you know, you just go out there and, and think outside of just like, don't stay stuck on thinking just, it's just film stuff that I have to look at or creative stuff. Like think outside the box, think of whatever it is. And um, as Nita was mentioning, it's, you gotta see yourself as a business too. And don't think like, oh, I wanna sell this or I, I, I'm just a creative. The way you gotta see it is how, how do you become sustainable? And in order to do that, it's like, you gotta make money <laughs> from it, right? So ultimately, you just gotta keep figure on venues or different resources to kind of bring that money and, and make that happen, make your project happen. But the first thing is mindset. Like make sure you have a winner's mindset. Don't automatically think like, oh, but I don't think that they'll say yes, or I don't think this or that, you know? Make sure that you automatically thinking like, it's worth it, this project is worth it because my community is worth it, because I'm worth it, you know, because our humanity is worth it. So you just gotta go in there with that kind of mindset. And ultimately, um, just to wrap it up, we ended up showing at the Orpheum um, here in town. Yay. <laughs> and that was, yeah, that was a big deal. Um, you know, we, we uh, the whole community came through, they helped us out, we, we premiered at the Orpheum, we submitted to several film festivals, um, we got accepted to I think over 12 of them, and then we got a jury award, we got best director award, um, and, and from there uh, our main distribution has been mainly, mainly academia, mm -hmm. because that's where we wanted our documentary to be. Currently our documentary is being shown in, um, at least I can think like, seven countries, uh, but in, in academia, like in Australia, in the UK, in Canada, um, Hong Kong, I think, I believe also, uh, the professors are using it as curriculum, you know, part of their syllabus, so people can learn more about this issue of immigration, and not only how it's something so simple that we would think it would just be here, localized in Phoenix, Arizona, but this is the global thing, you know, when it comes to immigration, and you gotta think of your issues that way too. We're human beings, and therefore, whatever is affecting you has a global impact. So don't think in small scale, like we're all interconnected, we're human beings, you know, whatever's affecting you is gonna be affecting someone else. So just know that, you know, use film as a medium to really um, connect and, uh, and then just see not the linearity, but also the circular effects that we're all interconnected and every social issue, whether you do it through a documentary or a fictional film, you know, you have a voice, so just use it. I just love that there's so much overlap, and yeah. and I, I want to expand on one um, topic. Thank you for just all that rich information because I could probably just talk to you alone for a half an hour about a lot of what you just touched on. Um, so I'll come back to it, but I'm um, kind of diving deeper into that notion of you have a sustainable product, you finally screened it, and now you know it's, it's catching on, but it's that slow build, right? Like you were on a, a marathon for this versus you know, a quick sprint and then you know, you've got a project and it's out and you're on to the next thing. And I think that um, kind of coming back to that theme around sustainability is really hard for young filmmakers or early filmmakers to have belief in their product and know that the, it's worth the long game. I mean, you to get here to Cahokia Unique has been a very long game, probably 15, 20 years, um, to be able to open your doors and, and you know, have your art form kind of and design start to build upon itself and the moments that you've kind of questioned, is this the route that I want to go? Is the door going to open? Um, and certainly in the industry, Nita, you know, you've also had a lot of passion projects, you know, but have had a slow build on how you've opened the door for your own EP and then, you know, educating other students to be where you're at, you know, and still kind of thinking what the next step is for you. So, you know, how, how do you sustain, and this is open for all of you before we kind of like get to the, the, the apex of our conversation, how do you you sustain your own energy and your own creative project when you know that you want to grow, you know that there is an opportunity to um, maybe even be financially um, prosperous within some of these projects, but sustaining yourself over 7, 10, 20 years and then also wanting to have some new creative projects within, you know, the, the pipeline, you know, how do you balance all of that and what's kind of uh, your secret to creating both the industry connections and financing, but also your own inner peace while you're 
creating your projects. Open to anyone. <laughs> a lot of questions. You know, look at you since you're the last one. But you know, I think that's the you know just to kind of it, you know as an aside, that's that's a really big thing, especially with female entrepreneurs. You know, we we I, I know a lot of powerful women in this city, and we're doing a lot of incredible things. But there's this balance of being a businesswoman mm -hmm. and also being a creative mm -hmm. and also being a mother for some of us and also like trying to be in a corporate and an independent mindset mm -hmm. it's it's a lot and you know and to chase your dream and <laughs> see <laughs> it's, it, it, is, is so, it is exhausting you know I but yet <laughs> i think one thing is yeah. like you have to be passionate about what oh, you're yeah. doing like this is what I live for, right? And <laughs> I'm gonna put all my effort, all my work into creating this space or being a part of this space or even like working with other people that I really admire and I want to do, you know, quality work with. It's, um, for me, it's um, more of a challenge to balance a lot of that because I come from, um, you know, a impoverished hometown and where water isn't exactly the cleanest and you know you hear about people dying on the regular because of just crazy things that you think shouldn't be happening um, and so when you have a lot of that and then you, you're here trying to create the space you are definitely trying to um, put put yourself um, in, forward in a way but also like leave room for the rest of the community so it is definitely a challenge and I think I have great people around me to be able to say like, okay, you need to slow down or you need, my son does that for me a lot. He's always like, okay, mom, calm down. <laughs> like, let's hang out or let's go do this or let's go watch a movie, you know? Um, so it's good to have people in your life that are constantly reminding you, oh, what about you? Take care of you. Um, so that's kind of how I pay attention. I, I think that's key. Having people around you that are going to support you is so crucial. There were so many times that I felt like giving up. And thanks to my husband just being there like, no, come on, you got this and cheering me on and telling me I could do it. Like it was just so helpful because otherwise I think I would have just given up if it was just enormous, you know, a gigantic kind of project. And I felt like, oh my gosh, I I felt like I was wearing way too many hats and my husband was too, but I mean, it was just having the support was really helpful. Um, and I think it's really important that before you go into any project, um, you write down the why really big, like even print it out and put it um, in your office or wherever your workspace is. Because um, the why is kind of like your passion, your motivation, and just know that uh, that's going to go away. You know, <laughs> especially if after, like you start hearing people saying, no, I don't want to fund it, or like, I don't believe in your project, then you slowly, your morale and <laughs> your spirit are going to start crumbling a little bit. Everybody should do film. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, but I mean, it's the passion that's going to lead you through it. So make sure you read the why and it reminds you constantly why you're doing this because the inspiration, the motivation is going to like, it's going to leave. Um, and eventually you need to have maybe perhaps that why or also that work ethic or that habits perhaps that you have created to guide you through. And, um, and then I don't know if this is uh, Nita and I were talking about how both of us, we actually are both yoga instructors yeah. and um, I'm a nutritionist as well. And she's oh, wow. also into nutrition and we're very much into spirituality. But I don't know if it's because the long working hours and film and everything that sometimes you don't take care of yourself, you know that maybe led me to go and seek out to become also a nutritionist and yoga instructor. But um, the reason why that came up was mainly because I was working on doing research for a food documentary and how mm -hmm. food, uh, or the history of our food and how it's impacting our health. And then I was like, I love the science of this, you know? And so I decided to go back to school, become a nutritionist. Um, but also like, I think most importantly is don't forget to take care of yourselves. We forget that so often, especially as women, you know, um, we think like, oh, I'm a superwoman, I could do everything, and perhaps you can, but I mean, ultimately, it's going to wear you down, mm -hmm. you know, so the first priority is your health, because if you don't have that, then you don't have a project, you don't have a film, or you don't have anything that you can do for others, mm -hmm. so also know that the energy 
that you have is what you're going to put in your films and in your creations. So if your energy is a little bit lower because you haven't been taking of your care of yourself, eating right, or you know, getting movement in, or getting some sun, then that's going to have an effect and an impact in the way you go about and approach your projects and the way you think about them. Mm -hmm. um, so just make sure that you really do take care of yourself in that sense, and mm -hmm. and um, things can wait. You know, just know that like, hey. I got to take a breather, go and take care of myself, and then you continue doing your thing because that in itself, more than the money, that in itself is more self-sustainable, <laughs> you know, than actually getting money to keep you as an artist going. Your health, your mentality is, is really important. Mm -hmm. so. And Nita and I, talk, I mean, I think this is the foundation of our friendship. This is what we talk about in and out is how are you doing, you know, uh, especially when we know that we're such hardworking women and we're very passionate about what we do, um, we kind of get these little spiritual impulses like, I haven't talked to Nita in a while, is she doing okay? Um, but it's because I know that there's a lot on your plate and you're very invested in your own work. So um, having that kind of work ethic, you know, yeah, just kind of passing the proverbial mic to you on the same topic. Well, I think all the women have kind of touched on something I was gonna say, which is, uh, you know, passion, uh, having the why and also really you have to do it for yourself if you're doing it for notoriety or to get this job or to be seen in this way it's gonna fall apart every time <laughs> crashes but if you're doing it because you feel passionate about it it is something that you could pursue for 7 to 15 to whatever how many years um, it's going to be successful and it's going to pay off infinitely because it's something that is authentic to you and to your voice and if you are trying to tell another story just to look a certain way and it happens a lot you know and, and it's not I have not to focus on the negative but it can be something that uh, implodes so that would really be my advice it's just something authentic that has uh, roots in who you are as a human as a being and also be okay with not doing like we're human beings so we can be a little bit and not always do uh you are creative we're all creative in this room i'm gonna assume that's why we're here so being creative doesn't always have to be meaning that you are making a film uh i've been sitting on a film i'm writing in my head i'm gonna be writing I'm going to be writing, but I'm sitting there, you know, for the last year just thinking about scenes, how I'm going to write it, who's, where's the location, how am I going to produce it? You know, I've just been sitting there. I haven't been writing it, and that's okay because I'm formulating the ideas, and that is going to be fine because when it's time to do it, I'm going to have, you know, these years of cultivating a true authentic idea that is going to resonate with me and then therefore resonate with the people I hire to be part of the production uh, and then hopefully the audience that someday views it at the film festival, right? Or wherever it, it distributes. So, uh, and then I, I do have my students who really encourage me um, to, to continue just by watching them every day, uh, so young, so innocent, thinking they can take over the world. And, you know, 19, 20 year old filmmakers are the most fun to hang out with because they're like, yeah, we're going to just make this feature film and, you know, <laughs> we're going to move to Hollywood and, <laughs> you know, uh, we're going to be the next Scorsese or whatever, whoever it is. Um, but uh, it's fun, you know, to live through those eyes too and to feel encouraged by their innocence and their youthfulness um, and their play. So. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, kind of wrap up this thought because clearly this is a very rich conversation mm -hmm. and um, we can talk about this for a long time, but kind of on, a, on an end note before we open it up for questions, um, uh, these ideas around your personal investment in yourself, both in your project and <laughs> in just your well-being um, and doing the little stretches a lot, I think the, that whole focus around you being your anchor um, allows other people to be attracted to your project um, because there's a sense of security and safety in how you are um, creating that, the, the tone of your project and the intention around your project, right? Because especially film, my goodness, you know, there are so many people that you have to bring in in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I started getting into graphic design a little bit, mostly because 
maybe only have to work with a few people, you know, like a videographer or myself, and I can still produce something. Um, and I think a lot of it was because there's so much risk involved when you include other people on your team. There has to be a lot of trust, and then there's even more investment, so you have to make sure that you're good with where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot um, leaning into your personal power and then also knowing your network. Um, I would say, at least for myself with the Zenith Experiment, a huge reason why it's been able to sustain and grow is because a shared values um, we talked about that a little bit and for my personal why just believing that music is needs to be everywhere you know um, music is transformational it's healing um, it's one of my per first personal passions but um, that's where I connect with people but I can also connect with them on a lot of different other creative levels but leaning into that and connecting with the right people who also resonate with that has allowed it to grow and expand because they might have an idea that gets folded in. Um, so I want to talk a little bit um, at the end of this about knowing your network, growing your audience, and, and creating um, a really solid team. Um, how has that been able to allow you to grow and what would be kind of maybe a last thought that you can leave the audience with on pursuing their own personal project? Yeah, so I think for me, um, collaboration is a learned thing. Um, a lot of times, and this is something that I've gone through explaining uh, to people when they, when they embark on this collaboration journey, there's a separation between cooperation and collaboration. A lot of institutions will think that collaboration is cooperation and they'll kind of mask it as that, right? Like you're gonna do a cool project for us and we'll fund it in this way and it'll have to go this, 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 and this way, right? Um, grant systems are sort of the same way where they have those key elements and you have to hit all of those things. So it's, that's cooperation. They're using your talents for their needs. Um, co collaboration is much different in the fact that there are autonomous things, beings, right? Coming together and their work is amplifying somebody else's work and you're vice versa giving each other value and energy doing the work that you normally do. Um, and that's what I really love about collaboration is that it allows people to bring themselves, their full selves, right? And their full power, their full um, energy and combine it with yours. And then you just make this larger energy pool and collaboration <laughs> is like such a cool, um, I think it needs to be practiced more and I don't think that it needs it like people are gonna like look at me funny but it doesn't need rules <laughs> but it needs it needs some sort of structure right and so a lot of times it's understanding tolerance levels it's understanding consensus it's understanding what what is the real mission behind this right what is the real value behind us working together and so building that network for me was always about um, getting that narrative right and getting people in that space that can tell their own narrative in the same way that we're doing it. So it's just, it's a cool thing to be a part of and I just want to keep um, talking about it in that way where I'm like, you know, <laughs> this is a collective, it's a mindset. It's not, um, you have to learn it uh, because westernized systems teach you opposite. They teach you a hierarchy structure from the get-go and you have to fold into that somehow. Um, and since I'm creative and I try and live outside of that, it's also a blend of the two, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I love, like, ditto. <laughs> what she just said. I, I mean, wholeheartedly, like, the reason I fell in love with film was because of collaboration. You see so many professional mediums coming together. You know, you have the your sound engineer, you have your director, your writer, your producer, and you know, um, in a way, they're each individuals and independent within their own craft. But yet, they come together to create this larger than life kind of thing. You know, and it's just so beautiful. So I think for me, while working in the documentary and and other projects that I've done, <laughs> it's uh, it's been like. Uh, trusting those that you collaborate with. Mm -hmm. uh, trust that um, whatever they're going to do is going to be great. That way you don't feel like, if you feel that you have to micromanage, then you definitely don't trust. <laughs> so the best, especially in a creative process, in a creative um, space, you know, what you want to do is just allow everyone to flourish and to mm -hmm. um, spread their wings as they would like to. And that's how creativity is 
best achieved. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you don't want to just um, just you know cut off people's imagination or creativity by saying, "Hey, no, that's not the way it's done," or this or that. You know, or we have these rules. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. You know, you have to follow X, Y, and Z. <laughs> um, it's more like, "Hey, let, let it flow." You know, uh, and just not just trust those that you collaborate, but trust yourself that eventually you'll get there. You know, there'll be times where you'll be like, where in the world is this going? Um, I feel so lost, but just trust the process, you know? And, and speaking of process, you know, enjoy the process. You know, it's not just about the destination of finishing your film <laughs> and getting something done. It's like, it's enjoying the process of making that film and enjoying the moment of being with those that you're collaborating with. You know, that's what life's about. You know, we're here, we're making this our lives right now. It's not about the destination of, oh, I just completed this other film and I just completed this other film and this other film. It's like, but did you even enjoy the process? Did you, did you have fun with everyone you collaborated? Did you, you learn know? anything? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, are you a transformed being from that, you know, um, from that project, you know, I, we sure were, you know, after so many years too, but after interviewing so many people with different perspectives, um, so many uh, professors from like sociology to law to activism to like all different fields, you know, um, it was just amazing. So we were left transformed. So allow yourselves to transform. Don't be resistant to it. So. You said it all. So I uh, uh, no, I think in any art form, there's a balance between solitude and collaboration, uh, especially in the seedling uh, stages, the initial stages. It's usually very uh, lonely at some points. I mean, I know like certain filmmakers spend two, three years just in uh, their head and thoughts and storyboarding and it's not till the second, third year that they feel solid on something that they bring in their collaborators. So like you said, enjoy the collaboration period because it's not always going to be around. It's an ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're in it, you should be just mm -hmm. grateful that all this hard work is now growing. Mm -hmm. Some filmmakers, you know, it's about the actual process more so than even the final product because once the final product is out in the world, it takes on its own life, like any piece of art. Once you release it, it grows into its own meaning to whoever views it at that point. So it, once you are gone, you know, it's kind of just like you birthed something and you can walk away from it uh, and allow it to have its own wings. So it's really, as makers, it's the collaboration point. That's like the process of growing the baby inside of you. That's like where the real work is. And um, that's why you should cherish it, I think, the most uh, of all the stages, right? Uh, and that's uh, also what, going back to what I said earlier, it's about your why, your, your, who you are as a maker, why me, why now, because that's the most important point. Part of it is that moment when you're building that, you're building something that then you will release to the world. So I think just enjoy the moment of collaboration and know that it will come again don't cling to it because you will make another film you will do another piece of art you know you will have another event so don't sit you know don't cling to it but just be in the moment with it and enjoy and i think that's when you'll get the most uh beautiful work is when you can just like trust your collaborators enjoy the ride and look back at that moment and say wow that's why i'm a filmmaker because of that <laughs> I love it. I love this really is the heart of this conversation is that magic, you know, and having the ability to know yourself, to know what you want to say, how you want to say it, how you want to present yourself, having grace and, and, um, and, and humility and compassion for yourself in those hard moments when you're trying to figure it out and you're trying to figure out what your creative process is and what to say. Um, but as you lean in, like, the, the, the network will come, you know, it's, it's inevitable. It's, it's part of that cyclical experience. It's part of like our design um, as people, as, as creatives. Um, and so while we didn't get into some of like the, the structured space of how industry is run, I, I do fundamentally believe that um, you having those tools, having your network, 
understanding, you know, like your funding um, abilities and capabilities and network and knowing how to put yourself out there, the next step will be there. Um, uh, but creating that strength for yourself and within your project and within your, um, uh, your team, I think is, is definitely uh, the, right, the right first mindset to, to explore your project. Um, I want to invite anybody else that's here to ask questions, if you'd like, before we conclude. Yes. Uh, really, really great presentation, by the way. I love what you. you're touching as far as wellness, especially uh, intentionality. Uh, everything you guys have said has been really great. Speaking more to specifics on fundraising, mm -hmm. uh, how would you say you each uh, leverage your own resources versus others? Mm -hmm. Tend to be extremely expensive, and you spend a lot, and you kind of go sour sometimes by spending so much of your own, but it's your baby, yeah. uh, versus you know finding the right balance. So I just like to uh, inquire as to you know your process as how much you know you found that you had to invest with your own versus others. Uh, I mean, I can just speak genu genuinely that um, there is like. Great, great importance in having a business plan prior to going in and then adding contingencies into that because there always will be a moment that something goes awry and you have to spend, or your day goes over and you have to spend extra on crew and all of that. So just allowing for a very strict budget and contingencies and seeing, okay, now even before you hire a crew, even maybe right after you finish the first draft right, of your script, like allowing for you to have space for, okay, this is what this is gonna cost, including festival fees, all of that. And now what can I tangibly put towards that? And then what is like, what will I actually have to raise? Uh, and I think crowdfunding is the way to go because you are not really beholden to an, an investor uh, you know, you want to give incentives to your crowdfunding, uh, posters and those kind of things that get people to invest, but it's really a little bit of a, a way to like know how much money you have, how much the crowdfunding uh, warrants, and then how much should you go after for investors, and then try to figure out like a happy medium. Like in my projects, I've luckily always been able to crowdfund the amount that I needed. Uh, and I've never really had to go out of pocket because a lot of times that money, you'll never see that again. Uh, I really don't, I mean, unless it's, you know, the best case scenario gets sold uh, at a, a festival and a distributor will then give you money to make a feature length or whatever that is. But uh, I mean, and you can probably speak to it too in your own process, but I find that creatively, like um, having not an investor there to tell you what to do at every point is an ideal thing. Uh, but going out of pocket is not always easy for us artists, so finding that happy balance of like crowdfunding investors and pocket money together, like take a second job, you know, save up. <laughs> uh, don't ever put you in a position where you're like, uh, oh, I thought it was going to cost, you know, 10 grand and now we're at 45 grand. It shouldn't be that way. You should always... I know, there, but that's why I say contingencies so that you're able to then say like, okay, um, if say for instance, you know, we like crash our car into the side of a building, which has happened to me on an independent film, and we have to <laughs> pay the insurance and, you know, the replacement and all of that, well, we have this extra savings there. I mean, you can't think of everything, but there are times when things go awry and you need extra money. So it's a long-winded answer of just like plan. <laughs> I also heard a 30% almost. Th like, you put 30% in? 30% crowdfunding, 30% yeah. maybe from someplace else. And, you know, you're, you're going to be willing to put some investment when you're, if you're creating a project, you're already invested. But mm -hmm. financially, you, you're yeah. likely to, to maybe 30% if you're, if that's what I'm hearing from you, just roughly. Yeah, and uh, if you, you're not even going to get to pay yourself more than likely, right? So uh, there's also that part. Your time is worth something too. So uh, when you get money from investors, like thinking about, is there any money even to pay myself? I know I'm paying my crew. I know I'm paying, you know, the, the caterer and all of that. But am I paying myself for my work? Because independent filmmakers should 
pay themselves for their work. <clears throat> it's valuable. It's entertaining people, right? So we should get paid too. Also use the system. So if you don't have an LLC, you should probably start with one because that really, if especially if you're planning to invest on your own um, through your own capital and your own independent streams, if you're an LLC, you're able to structure it in a way where you could get tax write-offs, you could pay for your mileage, right? And all of these begin to build up. Um, and if you're a good um, bookkeeper, then you have that ability to say like, okay, last year I did this and I need to tweak it in this way. Or um, I think there's, there's a system there. Um, you just gotta tap into it. I think a lot of times people forget that business aspect. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, yeah, you end up flushing away a lot of money and it, you never see it again. Yeah, no, the first thing, thanks to my husband's savvy business abilities, we created an LLC. Um, not just for, you know, tax write-offs, but in case there's a lawsuit or whatever, you know, you're protected in that kind of yeah. sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you no, get some? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. That's where the insurance and the, yeah. you know, all of those um, things yeah. fall into place. Yeah. But right. I mean, I, I don't know specifically, you know, percentages like 30% or anything. Yeah. I mean, for good say you don't have to sell your partner to make your film like I did, but it depends how passionate you are, you know? Um, it may be like, now I have a documentary behind me, maybe it was worth it, you know? Now I have the credibility, you know? It depends, the investment, how you wanna see it. Now this has allowed me to more, move more freely within asking for more resources. Now, perhaps not all of the money that I had invested initially was returned to me, but looking in the long run, it might eventually start to now. Um, if anything, maybe invest in creating something short that you can actually have uh, a proof of concept to like your future investors, you know, like, hey, now I have something instead of just presenting like words or pitching an idea or, or something like that. Sometimes they wanna see some visual. So maybe perhaps use some of the first money that you have from your own pocket to create something short that you can show them like, this is where my idea is going. And then once they see that, they're like, oh, okay, I really like that. Let me give you the rest of the money so you can continue doing the rest. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that, yeah, I mean, that would be the, the best way to go about it for so sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, grants and fellowships. We didn't really talk about fellowships, but that's another incredible opportunity. Some of the films you played at the festival, one of the filmmakers had a Sundance fellowship. Um, that's also how Damien Chazelle did Whiplash. Uh, he had a, a screenwriting fellowship with Sundance. So those are also mm -hmm. really important to look at. But personally with me, my, my mom was a grant writer, so I was able to use her to help. Uh, there are lists online that you can go. There's Oh, there's so many grants for for all kinds of creatives uh, and there's grants for women in film there's grants for indigenous women in film there's you know so you can find your niche uh, and 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 connect with that organization and they usually will help you write or just help you you can call them and I've never written a grant how do I do it and there's usually someone in the office that's happily going to tell you how to do it um, I teach at ASU full-time now and they give out lots of grants to our students so uh, I see students writing grants and that's, you know, if the students can do it, I think we can do it. Um, you know, they're 19, I keep saying that, but uh, it's just, it really is paperwork and it's, again, going back to knowing your project, knowing what this project is worth, the why of the project, the passion of the project, and then all of that the budget. being said, the budget, <laughs> <laughs> the budget yeah. of the project, the timeline, the timeline <laughs> of the project, all these important things you put into your, you know, production by just all of it, your business plan and having that clarity and that passion comes through in this boring paperwork that you have to fill out. Uh, that was just my experience. Yeah, no, I mean, grants are boring. <laughs> it's a lot of, especially as a creative, you don't want that administrative kind of process, you know, but just take it into account. It's kind of like, I don't know if you all had to write any scholarships, you know, it's kind of the same process. Once you have one done, you can just copy and paste, yeah. you know, for the rest. And, um, and also, as you were saying, it's, it's a great tool to help you think about your project. You know, that way it helps you think about your budget. It helps you think about your timeline. It helps you think about your crew. It helps you think about um, 
you know, uh, your, your um, style of uh, filmmaker, you know, your why, um, all these other kind of questions that you should kind of have an idea of before you go forward into a project. So it is a tedious process. Um, some of them do have contingencies. Sometimes they ask, oh, well, then you have to show here, you have to do that. So you gotta make sure that you do read exactly what each one of them would want and is asking of you. Um, some of them don't ask anything of you. They'll just give you the money. Um, sometimes they'll, they won't give you the money all up front. They'll probably say, okay, I'll give you maybe a third so you can get this stage done. And then um, like a third for developing, another third for you know, production and another, the, the rest you know, for um, post-production. So it really helps you, um, I guess, get your project thinking about it and how you're gonna go and approach it. Um, I guess it's, it's just, it's kind of like writing your, your um, or would you say your business, business plan? Your plan. Business plan. Yeah. That's what it is pretty much. Yeah. So um, it is tedious, but it's very needed. So, uh, and like I said, you can just copy and paste after that and, and just continue that. But it, it's a really good way to think about your project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did we have time, I, you raised your hand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you ladies so much for being here today, um, for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, your magic. Mm -hmm. um, appreciate you very much. Thank you to Cahokia, to Indie Film Fest, to Maddie, um, and to all of you for taking the time to join us today. Okay. Okay.